All right, guys, so I would be surprised if this made it to YouTube, but we are going over Morning, Modernism, and Postmodernism by Tammy Clewell. Um, it's a essay on Virginia Woolf, uh, specifically, well, it's called uh, Chapter One, Woolf and the Great War, so you can see that. Um, yeah, so I've only gotten to about halfway through it, um, but kind of things that modernism kind of focuses on is death, uh, mourning. Well, specifically, I guess in this is, is mourning, time passing. Um, and specifically, a lot of this section is on Jacob's Room, uh, which is a Virginia, Virginia Woolf novel uh, that I haven't read. And I'm kind of surprised that it focuses so much because this is kind of what we're focusing on. Um, what we're focusing on is to the lighthouse uh, and it does talk about that halfway uh about halfway through um this essay but okay just some we're just gonna kind of go through it um so i'll go through a quote a couple of quotes on pages we'll see where we get at with that um so quote they define wolf's life and writing as an unfortunate case of pathological grief uh which is for sure uh True. I mean, just the amount of uh, sexual abuse that she went through, uh, the trauma that has kind of plagued her her entire life. Uh, she was really, um, really emotionally um, conflicted. Uh, she just had bouts of um, intense, intense uh, depression, uh, things like that. I mean, the way she killed herself is she went into a lake with rocks in her pockets, I believe, and just drowned. I mean, to do that is uh, she really kind of, I believe she was going through an emotional and traumatic uh, situation at that point. But I also believe it was to kind of avoid it, you know, just to just see what's done. Uh, just rather dying is rather is more preferable than going through the intense kind of things that she went through. Uh, so on page 26, uh, quote, Wolf does, Wolf does defy the orthodox assumption, still reigning in some circles today, that healthy mourning comes to a decisive end when the bereaved, bereaved have attached emotional bonds from the lost object and accepted some form of con consolation for the loss, end quote. So, this is the morning modernism, postmodernism uh, is kind of talking about how we mourn, um, what really, what as an individual can we do to kind of move on from these um, traumatic experiences of loved one dying. Uh, we, I, I think we can all relate uh, to that kind of idea, but this is saying defying that healthy mourning comes to an end when they have detached emotional bonds from the lost object and accepted some form of consolation for the loss. So it, it's saying it doesn't end. It, it doesn't end. Um, even when we have quote unquote closure, um, that, that, that idea is kind of a myth that we really don't access the, the ending of trauma or mourning doesn't really end it. And, Later on, it talks about the religious kind of aspects with that. Um, morning in, uh, what Tammy Cleewell, Cleewell, yeah, is saying, uh, morning emerges in these novels I shall so show as a personal and social labor based on sustain sustained rather than severed attachments to loss. Here, let me read that quote. Morning emerges in these novels I shall show as a personal and social labor based on sustained rather than severed attachments to loss. Um, it's kind of a confusing quote. I shall show. She's basically just saying that these, what she's going to show in these novels. So we'll just continue. Uh, I intend in this chapter to explore how her novels resist consolation as well as show how this resistance emerges as a specifically gendered assault on conventional mourning, right? So like I said, the, the, we are attacking the idea of Victorian mourning, which is kind of a religious 
more uh, that we can get to an end, right? Like that that there is an end. Uh, particular interest to Wolf includes religious immortality, uh, individual heroism, soldierly self sacrifice for the national cause. Uh, Okay, I'll read this one. Her, quote, her work demonstrates more specifically how consolatory beliefs threatened to perpetuate in the years following 1918, the kind of pre-war values that placed male combatants on the battlefield and devalued women's social roles during the period. Uh, so we we are going through this transformation and Wolf knows that. I mean, Wolf knows that she's a kind of pioneer in uh, modernist thinking. Uh, so she's she's really changing the game uh, from this idea of that we can get to an end. I can't, I'm kind of repeating myself, but we're just in the first page anyway. So um, she wants to change the idea of men uh, and their role in war and their uh, acceptance of war as kind of this nationalistic pride that going to war is is what is kind of required for a man uh she wants to dismantle kind of patriarchal uh influences in jacob's room so this next section uh titled female grief becomes feminist grievance in jacob's room um jacob's room has frequently been read as a modernist modernist critique of wartime idealism the belief in god king and country that led the generation of 1914 to its tragic end, right? So, like I said, she, she is dismantling these kind of uh, traditional values. Um, Wolf modernist text thus assumes an elgic form. I'm not really 100% sure how to say that, but it, it's kind of with a point. Like, the the it has a point to how it's constructed, what it says. Uh, refuses to allow even the novel that commemorates her protagonist's life to compensate for his death. Yeah, so there's no there's no end. I mean, there, there's no reason for this kind of death. There's no um, there's no completely honoring this death because death is kind of this this thing that I guess in this situation has been ha, is is able to be avoided or an unnecessary call to death for nationalism, I would say. Um, Wolf's novel responds to these questions by demonstrating how the inherited mourning rituals no longer adequately mediated the complexities of loss. Conventional death ceremonies offered forms of consolation that Wolf rejected on intellectual and social grounds. So there's no reason um, Jacob's room appeared at a time when public mourning rituals had already shed much of their Victorian extravagance. Uh, but its pages offer a virtual catalog of traditional death observances. So like tombstones, burial customs, epitaphs, requiems, elegies, and monuments. Um, this cataloging enables Wolf's narrator to parody those vestiges of belief that continued to allow the shared customs of mourning to offer cons consolation. Yeah, like, so the, uh, I, I am saying the same thing over and over, but like I said, that's kind of what this is about, destroying mourning practices uh, for a Victorian era that has, has in I would say in Wolf's uh, perspective, destroyed death perception. De death, not depth but death perception um, and what we do after that. Uh, Wolf undoubtedly recognizes the validity that mourning has for analyzing culture. Um, I think we all do. I mean, just the kind of concept that we can understand death, um, at least in the kind of human perspective rather than a religious perspective, that once death happens, you're not here anymore, uh, at least in kind of a material form. Um, the Victorian working classes sought in death a level of affluence that they had not enjoyed in life. And that's and this is where um, she really wants to dismantle it because kind of kind of going through life thinking that you're 
that your main goal is to die to to really experience the afterlife um is is kind of i think where wolf gets at as a um problem and i would agree so um earliest the expense entailed in adopting the conventions of grief prompted many late 19th and early 20th century commentators to argue that social protocols served as sources of financial anxiety and commercial exploitation rather than ritual supports for the dying and their loved ones, right? So it's an ex it's an exploitative uh, kind of system, kind of uh, we're making money off of people thinking that things are more important in the afterlife rather than uh, present, uh, which is, you know, kind of uh, capitalism uh, kind of uh, kind of relates to uh, eco or disaster tourism. Um, the idea that when something like Chernobyl or um, yeah, Chernobyl, that we tour Chernobyl rather than uh, go there to experience it. Uh, also kind of like the Holocaust um, that, the camps of Dachau and Auschwitz are there to be toured uh, rather than um, some some other form of uh, understanding. Um, the rise, uh, Felipe Aries argues that the rise of technology and the secularization of society caused death to lose its traditional meaning. Death ceased to be understood as a spiritual transition to final judgment and immortality. Uh, that's kind of what we've been talking about. Um, just the transition of death. Uh, there's a lot on this page. Um, so I kind of have a quote that I wrote thesis next to. So we'll talk about that. Uh, Wolf's critique of consolatory death practices, while certainly influenced by class and commercial concerns, was primarily primarily generated by her view of the Great War, both the social causes that propelled Britain into the catastrophic violence and the failure of her society to affect any significant social change, particularly, particularly in the arena of gender reform in the aftermath of protected uh, fighting. Yeah, I, I, we've both, or we've kind of went through that. Uh, her novel clearly defines the traditions of consolation as complicitous in the production of wartime loss. Uh, that's kind of, I think that's kind of a new thing um, that wartime kind of instigates or promotes uh, death practices. Uh, that's that's a really interesting kind of um, way to look at it. Uh, Jacob's Room, however, jettisons all such consolatory paradigms. Uh, Wolf's novel offers no faith in religious immortality, no endorsement of funerary traditions, no praise of individual sacrifice for the national cause, no celebration of male camaraderie, no aesthetic smoothing over of the war's human cost of any kind. Um, yeah, she's just, it's just describing Jacob's room as being this kind of pushback against these ideas. Um, Given her interest in promoting post-war gender reform, Wolf's narrator offers a resolutely anti-heroic account of Jacob, repeatedly criticizing the protagonist for patriarchal beliefs and relentlessly chastising him for misogynistic behavior. Um, and in, in Jacob's room, just kind of a, a interesting thing is there isn't there isn't a specified narrator. It's just more of the stream of consciousness kind of idea. Um, that we we need to get into this kind of um, mind rather we need to get into it rather than be in it um, her feminist challenge to the masculine status quo uh, Wolf's narrator refuses in other words to idealize the war dead uh, such idealization she understood directly or indirectly endorsed pre-war values right so she really is after this, I mean, that's what this is about, the Great War. Uh, that's what the first uh, chapter of this book is about, that because of this Great War and its kind of ramifications and repercussions, that Wolf really attacks these ideas. Um, 
by the time Wolf addressed the subject of the Great War in her 1922 novel, the wartime social gains women made in factories, hospitals, and government had all but disappeared. Um, yeah, so she really, uh, she was definitely, obviously, interested in the kind of gender idea. Um, yeah, like I, I said, uh, the way that I kind of want to structure the channel is that you kind of understand these things through uh, the videos that I found. So it would be great if you kind of listen to them first, I guess. It, it really doesn't matter, but because um, we're really just kind of dealing with this text right here. But if you want to understand the kind of more of the background of Virginia Woolf and stuff uh, and kind of make it easier, uh, just kind of listen to those. Okay, so this, uh, there's only one. Wolf commends spearing, uh, EM spearing for describing soldiers not as self-sacrificing heroes, but as very ordinary people, right? So it's kind of this, um, it's just this kind of recircling idea of like go to war and it's awesome. I, I think it's kind of played out. I think we really don't need it anymore. But like I said, this is uh, 1922. Um, yeah, it's almost, almost 100 years ago. Um, but we really... In my, in my opinion, we really don't need those kind of narrations anymore. Uh, I think we can all agree war sucks. I mean, really. And we don't really want to sacrifice the individual for a nationalistic cause that we don't want to propagate. Uh, Jacob's Room, more specifically, counters the traditional role of mourner as submissive and passive, a role that placed particularly stringent demands on women who were not only obliged to carry out the restrictive sartorial codes and socialization of grieving to a much greater extent than their male counterparts, uh, but who were also expected to adhere to the long-standing pro prohibition against speaking badly of the dead, All right? So now we're getting into a different kind of thing, uh, the women's role in death, which it says right here that, that it is um, a primarily a woman um, kind of support system uh, at the end Later on in this, it does say it does talk more about the women, uh, kind of in death, um, after death. But uh, I think Wolf really wants to, um, like I said, change gender kind of uh, actions or roles after uh, death and mourning, especially in the Great War time. Um, her autobiographical essay criticizes the traditional practice of withholding hostile criticism towards the deceased. Um, yeah, that's more. Wolf's narrator in turn gives voice to this anger in the form of her narrative. Um, managing to express female grief in a way that refuses to silence feminist grievance. Uh, in doing so, the narrator seeks to render the world suitable for human habitation. Um, she seeks to mourn the protagonist while imagining a different future, not only for herself and other females, but for also for males like Jacob. Uh, and this is where I, I really respect uh, what Wolf does is because she wants to also change the perception of males, um, which is, is kind of, I think, something that's really lost in kind of the humanities. Uh, not entirely, obviously, but it, it is something that I'm really passionate about, uh, changing uh, male kind of perception. Uh, just uh, just like Wolf and a lot of other feminists um, and non-feminist writers want to do. So, um, the aggressive attacks on our male protagonists, clearly a strategic maneuver to combat gender constructs, begin early in the text. So, uh, I won't really anymore... Re really read any more uh, about that. Um, talks more about Jacob's kind of room. Uh, and then Wolf is always really interested in what's happening uh, in a room. Uh, like uh, her prose, The Moth. Um, the Moth goes from corner to corner to corner. Uh, it kind of shows. And uh, there are a lot of um, other kind of n women narration uh, that they're trapped in the room. I think probably the most famous is the yellow wallpaper. Um, but 
a uh, wolf really really gets into a lot of narrations with a room um and what we can do in that room uh at jacob's room <laughs> i didn't even think of that but um uh this also is, is categorized in death uh the cataloging and passing on of the deceased materials possessions cultural traditions as the narrator understands continues from one generation to the next through legal, social, and discursive structures of inheritance. It's not simply the possessions of the dead that are bestowed, but also the social meanings attached to those possessions. Um, Wolf's narrator contests the seamless, seamless continuity of English tradition and advance, advances the work of gender reform by setting up the novel as a bulwark against a structure of inheritance she defines as blatantly patriarchal. Um, I think that's true uh, in a lot of ways, um, but I also think that uh, the most important thing here, rather than the blatantly patriarchal, is just the idea of uh, cultural decisions and structures of inheritance. So, um, yeah, what what a family uh, kind of or an individual places so much important on that they have to pass it on. Uh, that it needs to be um, materialistically uh, still in this world, still in the family line. Um, but I will continue. Um, however, Jacob's possessions are not easily handed down, at least from the viewpoint of Wilson narrator, who sees his things as the lingering artifacts of male privilege. Um, which I'm sure it's true. I, I'd really need to read uh, the kind of perception of, and this is, it's undoubtedly true that the patriarchal kind of um, aspects of this uh, tradition of handing down is is patriarchal. Uh, but I have, I'd really like to um, speak about or read Jacob's Room. Uh, quote, nothing is passed on in Wolf's novel, nothing except for an articulation of the gender constructs that both licensed Jacob's sense of masculine entitlement and conspired to place him on the battlefield. Um, that's interesting, uh, kind of thinking about it now. Uh, the force, forced male um, placing on the battlefield, um, kind of a gender construct kind of thing. Um her novel clearly emerged at a time when consolatory animus drove public and private displays of mourning. Um, the war ushered in a modernist sense of irony and Western cultural expression to furnish cult consolatory meaning in the aftermath of the devastation. Um, Uh, I mean, it, it really is kind of um, regurgitating a lot. Reading this context, wolf resistance to constellation cannot be simply discounted as a modernist expression of melancholy and anger. Her novel, we might say, offers a vanguard awareness of the need for a mourning practice devoid of consoling figuration and the very expectation of strict closure. Uh, yeah, that's kind of what um, we've been talking about. It's kind of a good um, thesis, I guess, for what we've uh, talked about. Uh, so now we get into Derrida, um, and you know you kind of have to mention Derrida in anything, in anything, um, and by force of mourning, Derrida addresses a work of mourning that would have to fail in order to succeed, and claims that while this failure is always promised, it will never be assured. Um, I'm not really sure. By force of mourning, Derrida addresses a work of mourning that would have to fail in order to succeed. Uh, his emphasis on the potential for grief work to fail emerges in response to psychoanalytic theories of loss. So, Derrida argues that such psychoanalytic accounts of mourning perpetuate the main assumptions of the philosophy of the subject. They reduce the lost other to an object for the mourner. Okay, so I haven't read Derrida. Um, 
I don't think anything. I don't think I've read anything on Daredevil. But this kind of idea that mourning perpetuates the main assumption of the philosophy of the subject. Um, that's interesting, kind of keeping the idea alive, keeping, um, keeping the idea of an individual alive. Um, mourning allows the lost other to be recovered in the language of the symbolic so that the subject can avoid admitting that something of the self has been lost with the other's departure. Um, yeah, so so we really are getting and kind of delving into the um, the ramifications of the lost one. Uh, what what um, can we do after? How can we still relate ourselves to this individual? Um, this anach anachron anachronism indicates an outside that shatters any illusion of strict identity and relates us to the law of what does not return or come back. For Derrida, then, the acknowledgement of another's death entails an acknowledgement of our own death. The mortality we embody is a condition for life. Right, so um, kind of getting back to the religion uh, aspect of it to where what, what are we when we die? Um, the mortality is our mentality um, kind of given to us by a divine uh, power or is it uh, simply constructed or is it simply mortality is what I'm saying. Uh, more a physical, we live, we die, that's kind of the end of it. But Or is it given to us uh, by a godly kind of figure? Um, Derrida's very thick. I, I really kind of have trouble... Um, Thing about Derrida, but Derrida in this instance uh, really comes in handy talking about uh, the passing of an object to the uh, individual left behind. Um, in a similar fashion, Wolf's novel insists on the difference between the lost other and the mourner's memory of the lost other, um, showing how the brave narrator refuses to accept her own signifying authority as adequate compensation for Jacob's loss. Um, yeah, I, I, I really feel like um, we've kind of already talked about this. I won't keep, just keep babbling on about it. Um, Okay, so now we're now we are talking about kind of modernism and the break uh, from Victorian kind of ideas. So more recent critics, however, understand the narrator's self-defeating remarks as an inter integral part of Wolf's modernistic break with the conventions of Edwardian realism. Um, yeah, so now, like I said, we're getting into kind of genre and kind of type of writing that Wolf really wants to propagate. Um, Wolf highlights the inscrutable features of Jacob to portray the sense of someone who remains a permanently unknown quantity. Uh, that's Alex Zwerdling. Um, so kind of this lost individual, like your soldier rather than Jacob who signed up for war. Uh, the conflict between telling Jacob's life story and representing the impossibility of doing so may be understood as gauging the ethical imperative of mourning. The narrator's willingness to deflate and ultimately abandon her own projections and conceptualizations of Jacob function as a powerful critique of desire to master loss through the order of representation. That's interesting. To master loss through the order of representation. So, yeah, to clearly define uh, what death is, what um, what we can do to um, consolidate power, I guess, through representation. Uh, it's a really good um, kind of way to say what we're doing, uh, what Wolf wants to counteract and what we're doing um, in this kind in this kind of a uh, essay. Uh, okay, so now we're getting into um, morning art into the lighthouse uh it's kind of the second section i haven't read it so i'm going to
to call off the video for right now, especially since it's already been an hour and a half. Uh, this is my first time doing a kind of secondary source to um, a main novel. So I will make this into a two part um, video, but I will not, I will, tr I won't say I won't, I will try not to do that again, uh, especially because this is so thick. Um, but yeah, thanks for staying. If you if you stayed the whole time, that's awesome. Um, I will make another one right after I finish this. All right, thanks guys.